many of you are very familiar with the polity and the regular uh, practices of the United Methodist Church. One of them is uh, every year as we get to the beginning of the summer, most every conference does uh, an appointment process. That happens really all year long, but those appointments are announced of which clergy will be going where, and they get appointed to various different churches. However, on special uh, occasions, I guess it's a pretty irregular thing when it happens, but every once in a while, the bishop will go out of the normal timetable of things and appoint people to churches to serve in a pastoral capacity. This week, uh, we are one of those churches that has received not one, not two, but three different pastoral appointments here. And that happened as uh, Wes Savage, Patty Copeland, and Nancy Harper officially became licensed local pastors to serve at River Chase United Methodist Church in full-time ministry. As such, we wasted no time in getting Nancy Harper into the pulpit. It's, uh, I asked Nancy if it, would, uh, if it would be okay if I said a few things before she preached this morning. And I, I want to say what, what an honor it is that I, I am so humbled to be able to uh, be here with all of you to listen to Nancy give her first sermon in this church that she has faithfully served for so many, many years. There is uh, probably not a person in this room that Nancy has not touched their life in some way through her teaching, her other various ministries, and as director of discipleship, she is truly a disciple among disciples. I know that she has been uh, working hard on this sermon, uh, and uh, you know that Nancy has a beautiful way with words, and now I'm putting extra pressure on her, I realize. <laughs> but I've told Nancy time and time again that she is my favorite person uh, who offers prayers in our services because of the way that she has with language. Um, and she, she's poetic without trying to be poetic. She uh, instills such depth in her words without it coming across as lacy or overdone. Um, and, and I know that her preaching will have the same effect on all of us. Uh, out of the whole Bible, she has selected uh, a passage from Daniel, which I will be reading in just a moment. But uh, let's take a moment now and be in a time of short prayer for our sister Nancy as she prepares to preach to us this morning. God, the way you call your servants for ministry happens in so many varying ways. And we thank you, God, as a church, that you have called Nancy to this very special and this particular ministry. She indeed doesn't begin her ministry today, but did so many, many years ago. And now today we see again a milestone in this vocation that you have called her to. So be with her as she prepares to lead us in our worship this morning through preaching of your word, for sharing of wisdom, that we might have open hearts and open minds to the ways that you would be leading us through her preached word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture this morning can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1004, and then we'll skip to 1008 from the first and the third chapters of Daniel. Then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight, and competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years, so that at the end of that time, they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah from the tribe of Judah. The palace master gave them other names. Daniel, he called, Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azteriah he called Abednego. And now let's move to the third chapter.
starting in verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in, so that they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, but you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, and drum, and the entire musical ensemble to fall down and to worship the statue that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. And who is this God that will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire, and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tyler. And I also have to say a word of thanks to my Wednesday morning Bible study class. They were kind enough to buy the robe for me, and the stole was handmade by my sister, Reverend Phyllis Averill, before her death, for her own use, and was given to me at her funeral by her husband, my brother-in-law. So I feel surrounded by your love as I move into this new role. I do feel a little uncomfortable here behind the podium in a robe. I'm much more used to being at a table teaching a Bible study. But I am going to uh, follow the advice of the Committee on Ministry, which said to me in, in their encouragement, um, just remember, preaching is just teaching without interruptions. So um, if I see your hand raising and waving wildly, I'm going to restrain from calling on you and just say, please see me after class. When Tyler chose our uh, sermon themes for this particular period on transition, times of transition and renewal, I don't think he realized quite how appropriate that was going to be and quite how fitting. And yet we are not the first to go through times of difficulty, of loss, and our words of scripture speak to that this morning. Let me give you a little bit of background of what comes before these verses from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or about them. King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon has come in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He has destroyed the temple, that is the people's place of worship, destroying their connection to God, he hopes. He's destroyed their city. And then talk about a loss of leadership. He takes the cream of the crop, the best, the smartest, the most intelligent, brightest people he can find, and takes them to Babylon. The others he leaves behind, enslaved, in a city that's been destroyed. That's a lot of transition. The other thing that he does here, kept King Nebuchadnezzar is a smart man. And when he takes Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to Babylon, he changes their name, as Tyler read for us in the scripture. And this is a very common biblical practice because it demonstrates a sense of control Nebuchadnezzar is saying to these guys, I own you, and you'll do what I say. Now, you might think that's a, an unusual perspective, but if you think about it further, I know you can come up with other places in Scripture where people's names have been changed and power is demonstrated. Think about Abram, not Abraham. That's his changed name. God changes Abram's name to Abraham. And by accepting that name change, Abraham says, 
I accept your authority in my life, God. I will act on that authority. So control is given of his life to God, and he goes on to be the father of a great nation. So this is essentially what Nebuchadnezzar has done in changing these men's names. Now, in the covenant Bible study we just completed, there was a section on the book of Daniel. And there was a very in interesting insight that was given by the professor from Loyola Marymount University that was um, leading this discussion. He said that this whole idea of name change took on new meaning for him when he read the biography of Malcolm X. Now, I have not read that biography, but his point was this. Malcolm was not born with the name X. He was born Malcolm Little. He made the decision to change his name for just this same reason of control. He felt that Little was a name given to him by slave owners in the past, and he did not want to be controlled by others. So he took the name X, meaning unknown. And he was thinking of his unknown tribes from Africa when he took that name. So a name change intentionally to avoid being slaves. So the professor's point is this. Isn't it interesting that in this group of names that we remember not Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but the slave names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And my point to you is, we don't, it doesn't matter what their names were. We remember their great faith. Now I wanna say a word about Daniel here. The professor didn't address this but it got my curiosity up. How come Daniel gets to keep his name? We don't know him by his, his slave name of Belteshazzar. And I finally decided that's just too much of a mouthful in any language. <laughs> so John Ray is with us this morning and he is so well known here for what we on staff call his Kentuckyisms. And he has one that applies to this situation. That should be no surprise. I have worked with him 20 years. He's still surprising me with new Kentuckyisms. The other thing you may know about John Ray is he is always too hot. And so many times we can find him walking down the office halls saying, has anybody seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because it's just about that hot in here. And he is heading for the thermostat. So I don't know about you, but I don't think it would quite have the same ring for John to walk down the hall and say, has anybody seen Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Unless you're really up on your Daniel, I think you wouldn't know who he was talking about. So um, regardless of what we call these men, we know them by their faith. And the interesting thing is how they stay true to this faith. I'm going to reread a portion of the scripture that Tyler read for us, but I'm taking it from the New International Version because I want to emphasize its translation of some very important words. These are verses 16 through 18 of chapter three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let me repeat that. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Notice their love of God here 
is not conditional. It's not, if you save us, we're going to be faithful and worship you. That comes first. That is the most important thing. And I think this is the faith that we need in our own lives as we face times of transition and change. And it's why this Bible story particularly inspires me. I watched a film several years ago in a disciple series. I'd already seen it several times. And uh, I, I jumped up while we were watching the film, stopped the frame, because on the screen was a painting, a, a serious painting that was depicting the parable of the sower. And, and we had the farmer plowing the land, we had the birds to the side, and we had the seed in the foreground. And then I noticed for the very first time in the left foreground corner, there was an empty McDonald French fry package. I'm not kidding you. I couldn't get over it. We couldn't figure out what it meant. And so I ended up emailing the, the uh, artist that had painted the picture. And he sent me back the most interesting reply. He said, I often put the golden arches or other fast food symbols in my paintings. And he said, I do that as a reminder that we as a society have tended to choose religion and faith that serves convenience and comfort. That's not the kind of faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego demonstrated, nor is it Daniel's kind of faith. We are just coming off the Lenten season, and during Holy Week, between Monday and Easter Sunday, we have 11 worship services that we had at this church. And five of those were five of my favorites in that we had them jointly with the other four Protestant churches here in the neighborhood. I think this is a wonderful message of faith to us that we serve the same God, the same Christ, the same Savior. And after one of those services, I was down in the River Chase room having lunch, and two women came up to me. One of them is an acquaintance of mine, not from this church, and the other one I did not know. And the one I did not know said to me, I just wanted to say hello to you. She said, you don't know me, and I don't really know you. But I know that you have a name. I was totally humbled and um, complimented by this. But the other woman, my acquaintance, said, of course she has a name. Her name is Nancy Harper. She missed the woman's point straight over her head. What the woman was saying to me, I, I may not know you, but I know your reputation. And I hope the reputation she was thinking about was a reputation of faith. So while I don't have a slave name and I don't feel any real need to rename myself, I did get to thinking again about Malcolm X. And I decided that in some ways I want to add that X, but not Malcolm's X equal unknown, not anonymous kind of faith. I want to add the X that stands for the Greek letter chi, first letter in the name of Christ, stand in for the name of Christ. So when you see the word Xmas, it's really Christ's mass. Now Holiday Inn has already renamed my husband along just these lines. Whenever he gets his statement from them, his James T for Thomas Harper has been changed to James X Harper. That's what I want for myself. I want the Holiday Inn people. I want the Baptists. I want the stranger to know that implied within my name 
is Christian, follower of Christ. I often ask myself the question from this old adage, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And so I ask you this morning, which X do you choose? Do you want to be unknown, mainly anonymous, or do you want to be a follower of Christ? Because strangers will know which X you have chosen. They won't have to ask, what is your name? Amen. Let's say a brief word of prayer to God. We thank you for this day before us, O oh Lord, and we ask that we, you would make us powerful witnesses for your name and your good news, not only in times of transition, but every day. Amen.